let's take a look at nuclear reactions. And we'll start out by defining a new mass unit. This new mass unit is called the Unified Atomic Mass Unit. It's a common unit to use in atomic and nuclear applications because it's very, very small. We represent it with the symbol lowercase u, and it's defined this way. Unified Atomic Mass Unit is equal to 1 12th of the mass of a carbon-12 atom that is neutral, at rest, and in its ground state. I said it was very small. This is how it compares to a kilogram. One unified atomic mass unit is equal to 1.661 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Okay, so now let's start thinking about what's going on inside of nuclei. There are two forces which dominate the nucleus. There's the electric, or Coulomb, force, and the strong nuclear force. Now, the strong nuclear force we haven't encountered before, and that's because we haven't looked at nuclei before. But the strong nuclear force is a force which really is only noticeable on very small scales inside of nuclei. And strange thing about it is that it's kind of a binding force between nucleons. So I'll show you what I mean. Let's imagine we have a nucleus, uh, let's say beryllium-8, which has four protons and four neutrons. So if we imagine the nucleus as these four protons and four neutrons together, very close quarters, the electric or Coulomb force is going to cause the positively charged particles to repel each other. So those protons in the nucleus, they're very close to each other and they all have positive charge. So every proton will repel every other proton. The neutrons are not involved in this Coulomb or electric force because the neutrons do not have any charge. Now for the strong nuclear force, that's an attractive force between nearby nucleons. And it's only between nearby nucleons. The strong nuclear force has a very short range. It does not cause nucleons which are on opposite sides of the nucleus to attract. It only causes nucleons which are essentially next to each other to be attracted to each other. It's kind of like a glue that binds together close together nucleons. So that strong nuclear force is between all protons and neutrons which are close to each other. And that's binding this nucleus together while the Coulomb force is trying to push the protons apart. Now if the nucleus is stable, there's a balance between that outward repulsive Coulomb force between the protons and the inward attractive strong nuclear force between all the nearby nucleons. Now if there were an imbalance in the Coulomb force and strong nuclear force, if one were stronger than the other, then that would cause an unstable nucleus. If the Coulomb force is stronger, that would cause the nuclear, or excuse me, would cause the nucleus to try to fly apart. If the strong nuclear force was too strong, then that would cause the nucleus to collapse. And in the case of an unstable nucleus, where one force is stronger than the other, the way the nucleus ends up dealing with this is it decays. How does it decay? Well, it decays by radiating either alpha, beta, or gamma radiation until it becomes stable. Okay, now let's think about one of these stable nuclei. Let's think about a stable carbon-12 nucleus. So that has six protons and six neutrons. And I'm going to draw it as a combined set. So we're going to imagine the nucleus with six protons and six neutrons. And then we're going to imagine if we separate all the nucleons and put them all apart. If we do that, if we take a nucleus and then we separate all the nucleons, so we go in there and we like take a little, little tweezers and we separate all the nucleons, that would require energy to do that. It would require adding energy to the system. In other words, if we wanted to take a nucleus and pick apart all of the nucleons and separate them, we would have to do work to separate those nucleons. That's because we would have to act against the strong nuclear force. The strong nuclear force is trying to bind all of the nucleons together. If we went in there and separated all the nucleons, well, we'd have to add energy to the system to do that. Now, that means that the system of separated nucleons has more energy 
than the system of nucleons in the nucleus, right? If we have the bound together nucleus and then we separate them, in order to do that we have to add energy to the system. So the separated nucleons have more energy than the nucleons together when they're in the nucleus. As scientists started examining these kinds of situations, observations started to indicate that these separated nucleons not only have more energy, they have more mass than the nucleons when they're together in the nucleus. Now that's a little strange. Uh, if, if you had a bowl of fruit together uh, and you measured all the fruit when it's in the bowl, uh, and you got that mass, and then you compared that to the mass of all the fruit if you separated them, if you put them in other parts of the, the room, like one apple in the corner, a banana in the corner, an orange over there, you would expect that the total mass of the fruit when they're separated would be the same as the total mass of the fruit when it's together in the bowl. But that's not the case with nucleons. The nucleons have more mass when they're separated than when they're all together in the nucleus. This is strange. What this is indicating is that an object or a system with more energy also has more mass. And it turns out that the additional mass that it has corresponds to the additional amount of energy through this equation, which probably looks familiar. In this equation, the meaning of the variables is E is the difference in the energy between the two states. It's how much more energy the nucleons have when they're separated. And M, that's the difference in the mass between the two situations. That's how much more mass the nucleons have when they're separated. And then C is the speed of light. Now this is a very strange thing. We're saying that something that has more energy also has more mass. Well, the next question might be, well, why don't we notice this? I mean, if adding energy causes something to gain mass, why don't we notice that? Like, if I start running along, I've, I've gained kinetic energy, why don't I notice that I've gained mass? Well, in everyday life, when we see energy changes, they're measured in things like joules, or maybe kilojoules, or even megajoules. These kinds of energy changes result in mass differences like around a nanogram. Very, very small increases in mass. So it is true that if you increase something, if you increase your energy by, say, starting to run, your mass does increase, but it increases by a very, very small amount. So we don't notice it. However, in nuclear applications, the amount of mass and energy change is noticeable if you have very sensitive instruments. So that's why this phenomenon wasn't discovered until people started looking at the nucleus. It's because these are very small changes and they only become evident on very small scales. Now, in nuclear applications, what this means is that mass is no longer conserved and energy is no longer conserved. Instead, what we have to say is that mass and energy combined are conserved. So it's a different perspective. Mass is no longer conserved. Energy is no longer conserved. It's the combination of mass and energy which are conserved. And we'll deal with that in just a moment. But before we do that, I'm going to introduce another new mass unit. Because knowing that energy and mass are connected in this way, we can define a new mass unit, which makes it a little bit easier on us. Now, there's an energy unit called a mega electron volt. It's one million electron volts, a mega electron volt. Now, that's a common energy unit that's used in nuclear physics. And we have this equation, E equals mc squared, which relates the energy and mass in an object, or at least the change in energy and change in mass. So if we measure an energy in MeV, then looking at this equation, we can measure mass in units of MeV per C squared. An MeV per C squared, that combination of units and variables right there, is actually a unit of mass. And it's a common unit of mass in nuclear and particle physics. Now it turns out if you do a little bit of math and a little bit of observation, you can find that one atomic mass unit, which we introduced a little bit ago, is equal to 931.5 
MeV per C squared. What that means is that if you have one unified atomic mass unit of mass, one U of mass, and you were to convert that into pure energy, we can figure out how much energy that is. So E equals mc squared. If we're converting one unified atomic mass unit to energy, well, one unified atomic mass unit is 931.5 MeV per C squared. And we multiply that by C squared. And so we get 931.5 MeV. The beauty of this MeV per C squared unit is that if you put it into E equals mc squared, the C's cancel out and you just get out a, an MeV unit. And we never have to use the speed of light in our calculation, so it's kind of a shortcut. Okay, now let's go back to this whole idea of the separated nucleons and the nucleus. If we take separated nucleons and we put them together into a stable nucleus, that is creating a more stable system. It's creating a system which has less energy. It has, it's creating a system which therefore also has less mass. And we call this change in the mass the mass defect. It's represented with the Greek letter, lowercase Greek letter delta. And this change in energy is called the binding energy. And both of them are considered positive. In this example, it looks like they should be negative because the mass decreases and the energy decreases. But the mass defect is just the change in the energy, or how different the energy is here, and we take the absolute value of that. And the binding energy is also always positive. It's the absolute value of the change in the energy between the two. Now, a more stable nuclide, then, a more stable nuclide will have a greater mass defect, right? Because there's a greater difference in the separated nucleons and the combined nucleons. If we have a more stable nucleus, that mass defect is going to be greater. Also, if we have a more stable nucleus, that means we have a greater binding energy, right? Because the energy difference will be greater. If we have a more stable nucleus, the change in the energy is going to be greater. So a common way to think about this is to draw a graph of the binding energy per nucleon versus the number of nucleons in the nucleus. If we do that, it turns out the graph looks like this for stable nuclei. Now, this is not a you know, nice, easy graph to write an equation for. It's not like a parabola or an exponential function or anything. But this is the way that it turns out that it's shaped. And there's a lot of things going on in this, but I want to point out a couple things. Here at the top, the maximum value of the binding energy per nucleon. Well, I said that the greater the binding energy is, the more stable the nucleus is. So the maximum of this graph is where the most stable nuclides occur. And it turns out that these most stable nuclides are iron 56 and nickel 62. Those two are the most stable nuclides. And so on the edges here of the graph, we have less stable nuclides because the binding energy per nucleon is smaller in those regions. Okay. This is going to lead us to the nuclear reactions we're going to talk about. Let's start with nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is the process of combining nuclei to create more stable, heavier nuclei. And in the process, it releases lost mass as energy. So that means you're taking nuclei from the left side of this graph, and you're combining them together to create larger nuclei. So it's kind of climbing this curve towards the more stable nuclides. You're increasing the binding energy per nucleon. And let's take an example of a fusion reaction. Let's look at hydrogen 2 plus hydrogen 3, resulting in helium 4, a neutron, and some energy. So in this reaction, in this nuclear reaction, we're taking two less stable nuclei, putting them together to create a more stable nucleus and a neutron. When you do this, you end up changing the amount of mass that's there. Turns out the two hydrogen nuclei that fuse together, they have more mass than the products that come out. They have more mass than that helium-4 and neutron that comes out. So when you do this, you lose mass. You have less mass in those things that come out. 
And this results in a mass defect, right? There's a change in the energy, or excuse me, a change in the mass from the beginning to the end. That mass defect, that change in the mass, well, where did the mass go? Well, turns out that mass was converted into energy. That's where the energy came from. In order to figure out how much energy comes out, what you can do is you can determine the mass defect. You can figure out how much the mass changed before and after the reaction. And the lost mass wasn't really lost. It was converted to energy. And you can figure out how much energy by using E equals mc squared. Now let's take a look at fission. Fission is the process of splitting nuclei into more stable, smaller nuclei and releasing the lost mass as energy. So what that means is you're taking nuclei from the far right of the binding energy per nucleon graph and you're splitting them into smaller nuclei. You're creating products which are more stable. So for example, if you have uranium-235 and you fire a neutron at it, you have to fire it at the right way, but if you fire a neutron just the right way at uranium-235, it results in the nucleus fissioning, splitting, into krypton-92, barium-141, three neutrons, and some energy. And if you look at the mass of the products, or excuse me, if you look at the mass of the objects that went into this reaction, and you compare it to the mass of the products that come out of this reaction, the products that come out are more stable. They have less mass than the products that went into the reaction. So there's a loss of mass in this reaction. So there's a mass defect associated with this reaction. And if you can find that mass defect, that difference in the mass from the beginning to the end, that lost mass is what is converted to energy in this nuclear reaction. And you can figure out, if you know the mass defect, you can figure out how much energy that corresponds to by using E equals mc squared.